So last time um, we heard, um, I told you how the how to construct uh, iteratively uh, left shed elements using um, using this Kronecker lemma. Okay, so last time. Um, we had this Kronecker lemma, which helped us to, right, um, essentially what it gave us is that um, bias pairing property, um, that the bias pairing property, so the non-degeneracy or the non-degeneracy of the Poincaré pairing at ideals um, implied somehow in, in co dimension one, co dimension one implied um, um, the existence of left shed elements. And then, well, okay, so to close the loop, we have to discuss um, how, in general, this um, bias pairing property um, bias pairing um, is implied maybe by, by left sheds in co-dimension one, again. And this closes the loop. And this is what I will, some of the first half will be spent on explaining that. Um, essentially what we discussed last time was um, how, we, how we get, some of last time, last lecture, we discussed um, the bias pairing property for ideals of the form I sigma delta, where delta for well, sigma a sphere and delta a co-dimension one sphere. And I want to um, um, essentially, now go to to general delta in a, in in, um, in a few small steps, um, and then I want to argue um, how these things then really fit together. Sum it up, um, and this somehow to to give you at least a feeling for um, how the proof of um, the left shed theorem um, works using this inductive principle. And then um, um, towards the end, so in the second half and tomorrow, I will go over um, another proof using transcendental theory, um, which um, does not, um, which does not really rely on um, on an inductive principle, but really just exploits some nice uh, residue formulas. Um, so. Let's, um, let's, let's, let's go over this, um, um, this case of these, these ideals I sigma delta again. Um, so last time um, we discussed this case I sigma delta um, where delta was um, a co-dimension one sphere. Um, Today, I want to um, verify this bias pairing property um, um, and in the case where, well, where delta is general and I will argue that it's enough to consider the case where I consider a pair I sigma delta, which is, uh, just to remind you, uh, this is a kernel of a map A of sigma to A of E. Um, and um, here for um, sigma, and we will look at this in the case where sigma is 
um, um, a 2k minus 1 sphere, dimensional sphere, over r field k, um, and E is a um, co dimension. Put I mentioned one manifold in uh, in sigma, and I will um, assume that um, we will assume that um, such that E is k minus one acyclic. Over k. Meaning that um, the homology of E vanishes up to dimension uh, dimension k minus one, and here's homology with k coefficients. Okay. Um, and this is a case that I wanted to look at, and let me just remind you, what am I trying to do? Well, I'm trying to show that if I look at the Poincaré pairing in sigma, to k, um, and I restrict it to this ideal, right, so this is a perfect pairing, and I want to restrict it to this ideal i sigma delta, um, all right. Then this pairing here should still be non-degenerate. So we want want this to be non-degenerate. Yeah. E is co dimension one, so it has dimension two k minus two, yeah? Yeah. And this homology vanish up to dimension k minus but on corner direction where are homologies? Well you only have it in the middle, right? I mean but it's, it's k minus one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, so it's strictly less of k minus one. Um, wait a second. So if I'm let me let me get to, to an example again. So if um, if if k is two, then I'm looking at a three-dimensional. Um, then I'm looking at uh, a three-dimensional sphere. The manifold is of dimension two, and I'm saying, ah, okay, um, you're right. Up to dimension k minus two. Let me say it like that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Thank you. Yes. Um, Otherwise, it's just a, a sphere again, or modulus sphere. And E is, is from that kind of connected, or H0? Um, so H0, um, it doesn't have to be connected, but I mean, the case where we have a one-dimensional sphere is kind of, uh, if, is kind of trivial anyway. Um, so we are, I mean, it's the case that we're interested in is really, is going from, from, from k equals 2 upwards, so three-dimensional spheres and higher. So um, we don't have to assume connected, but tomorrow with these assumptions, it will automatically be connected um, once, we, uh, once we hit the interesting cases. But yeah, let, let's ignore the case of one, one spheres for now. Um, all right, so we want to show that this is non-degenerate. Um, Okay, um, and now let me let me first discuss how the criterion to show that uh, that that this pairing is um, that this pairing doesn't degenerate. Um, and once again, um, what we are kind of what we can look at is the case where well we can look at i sigma um, e. But now let us observe again that, um, right, so that now it's kind of 
Maxim's remark becomes a little important. Uh, just a second. Also, don't go uh, confuse indices. I think this is AK sigma. What is? Okay, so this is so the, it's a middle pairing, the middle Poincaré. Middle, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is to A to K of sigma, which is just the real, just K, right? So E separates uh, separates. Um, sigma into two components, into two components, um, right? So I have, I have a component M and I have a component M bar, and again I have that I that this these two components. They span my ideal, and they are obviously orthogonal on each other because if I have a monomial supported here and a monomial supported here, then they multiply to zero because well they line different components so they don't form a face with each other, all right? So they are sort of obviously orthogonal on each other. So if I want to prove this, I really can restrict to proving it. For somehow we can restrict to um, showing non-degeneracy, non-degeneracy for i sigma m bar. Okay. And here's the theorem. Um, so I sigma far bar, I sigma m bar satisfies the bias pairing property if and only if. Okay, so now what I do is I, I look at um, um, a k of e. Now a k of e. This is okay. So this is just the, the quotient um, corresponding to my my hypersurface. Now, um, if you remember, in this uh, when we discussed the partition complex, uh, we remarked that there is a map of um, of the cohomology into a k of e. So specifically, we had a map from h k minus one of e with k coefficients to well to the d choose k to this to this ring. All right. So this came from um, the dis our discussion. Of the Poincare, uh, of of a partition complex in the context of Poincaré duality complex. Um, and now, well, this this here is okay. So this E is a submanifold of M. So I can write um, a map from H K of M. Sorry, from H K minus one. Of m with k coefficients, to I can write down a map from h k minus one um, of of m to h k minus one of e, and again I carry with me this tensor, this uh, this this tensor product coming from um, coming from the from the Costur, uh, um, coming coming from the Costur complex, um, and now okay so now I have a couple. Um, I have a composition of these two maps, and I want um, this composition here to be an isomorphism. If and only if, right, let me call this map here star, and then I can say star is an isomorphism. All right. Um, All right. Uh, 
the proof for this fact, it turns out to be just a little diagram chasing in the end. So, what I do is, okay, so I write down a short exact sequence like this. So let me write down, okay, let me, let me start with zero up here and then um, try to make the arrows short enough so that I don't waste um, too much space. So I have, I have IKME, um, which is defined for me as the kernel of A of AK of M to um, A of e, AK of E. All right, and this is a subcomplex, so this is a surjection, that's all good and nice. And then into a k of m, well, again, I have, I have my, my partition complex, so I have um, the map from h k minus 1 of m uh, with k coefficients, let me just not write down the k coefficients, to the d choose k. All right, and what is the co-kernel? Well, I mean, let me not describe it for now, for the moment. Let me just call it B of M, uh, BK of M. For the and now notice that our mystery map, right? This mystery map also appears again here, All right? Um, so it remains to 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 understand um, this map. So let's let's understand this a little. So this here. I can think of as mapping, so this is, uh, this is included into I sigma M bar, which is isomorphic to A sigma M bar, which we discussed last time. And then, okay, so what is B of M? BK of M, let us, let us discuss this, so B of, B of M, this is A of M modulo, well, now I look at um, the image of the direct sum of the vertices in M, a star of the vertex in M, all right, so this was our partitioning map. Um, in particular, this is just the kernel under the partitioning map, all right. Um, so, oh sorry, this is just the, the image under the partition name. In particular, this is the same as looking at A of sigma and modding out the annihilator of I um, sigma M bar. But as we discussed last time, um, having an injection from here to here, right, um, this injection, right, so this is in, an injection from an ideal to the, the Poincaré duality algebra to the string modulo the annihilator of the ideal. So this is, the injection here is equivalent to, um, to the bias pairing property. Bias pairing property. And in fact, it's an injection if and only if it is a, an isomorphism because, well, these spaces are Poincaré duals. So this is an isomorphism if and only if it's an injection. So now let's, let's look at this. So this, uh, this map here is an isomorphism. Um, okay, so if and only, okay, so this map here is an injection if and only if this map here is. But um, then, um, these two, are, these two spaces are of the same dimension, so if this map is also a surjection, this here will be an isomorphism, so these two will, spaces will be the same. In particular, I get this here is an isomorphism if and only if, this here is an isomorphism if and only if this is an isomorphism, which is exactly what we wanted, right? So isomorphism here is exactly the isomorphism here, which is exactly the isomorphism here. It's really just diagram chasing. 
So diagram tracing. Uh, gives us our result. Gives the isomorphism. All right. Um, and that's it. So it's really just a little diagram tracing. All right. Um, um, okay, so now, okay, so um, now I want to, okay, so now I went to, uh, I discussed hypersurfaces. And now I want to discuss um, general complexes, I delta. I, so how do we prove, how to prove um, that I sigma delta satisfies the bias, proper, the bias pairing property in general. Um, so how do I do that? Um, so I'm again in this case, okay, so I'm looking at a simplicial complex, right, a simplicial sphere and a subcomplex in it. Um, so we are considering, so sigma is of dimension um, 2k minus 1 um, and delta subcomplex. And really, I can assume that delta is of dimension of dimension um, k minus 1. Why? Because I'm caring about this ideal, which is, right, I'm caring about this ideal in de degree k. So I'm really only caring about, I'm on, really only caring about the monomials up to degree k, which means I'm only caring about the, the, the faces of the simplicial complex up to cardinality k, which means that I'm only caring about the simplicial complex up to dimension k minus 1. So the idea now is construct a hypersurface. Hypersurface um, E containing um, containing uh, delta such that um, A of sigma, oh sorry, A of E is isomorphic to A of delta um, and um, in particular that I sigma E is isomorphic to I sigma delta. And we will cheat a little. We will not achieve this in sigma itself, but we will achieve this in a subdivision of sigma. But we will see that this doesn't matter, um, that we do that in a subdivision. OK, so let me, let me explain that, and I will um, mostly restrict to the case where sigma is a PL sphere, just because I want to get to the transcendental, uh, transcendentality argument. Um, so I will sketch the argument and this construction and why this is enough. Um, and then I will kind of, uh, this will be the, the, then I will summarize uh, the, 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 what, what we did and uh, summarize um, the proof, and then I will go to, to the transcendental proof. And so, what, how do you translate it to the condition uh, how is it, how is it, is it Ah, okay, so. I mean, do you, are you going to construct E and E such that E is a cyclic? Or? Yes, yes, I will, okay, so I will, I will construct E such that it is a cyclic. So, this here will be K minus 2 a cyclic. That's, uh, Thank you. I will, I will, yes. Thank you. Um, so, okay. So let, 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 me, let me go over this construction. So first of all, let me
Let me note that the decomposition theorem implies something nice about um, some invariance property of this of this of the bias pairing problem. Uh, of uh, invariance property of the bias pairing property. There's too many properties. So invariance of the bias pairing property under subdivisions. So, um, and for simplicity, we will mostly assume um, assume that sigma is actually a PL sphere. Because, um, well, the construction is a little simpler in that case. Okay, so first observation. Um, subdivisions of sigma um, outside that do not affect do not affect um, that do not affect delta preserve the bias pairing property. Um, this, uh, so subdivisions here, um, for, for us we will take stellar subdivisions, but it's essentially every, uh, what you can take is essentially every sim simplicial map that preserves the fundamental class. I will give an example in a second. So for us, for us here, stellar subdivisions, for us, stellar subdivisions suffice. Because I restrict it to the PL sphere case, and I will just indicate what you, what other marvelous things you can do if you want more general. Um, and let me make a picture for to illustrate this. So let's say we have um, our simplicial complex delta. All right, so this is delta, and it sits inside our sphere sigma. delta and it sits inside sigma and then um, now perhaps uh, for some for, for, for some God's forsaken reason we don't like sigma so much it, does, it looks uh, it, for some reason it looks ugly somewhere um, um, and we want to refine it so let's say here there's a here there's a triangle somewhere and we want to really look at the blow up um, and so we want to take a stellar subdivision here so we have this and we want to replace this triangle by its stellar subdivision. All right. Um, in any case, whenever you have a subdivision of simplicial complexes, um, you can induce a map. So from, um, from the complex before the subdivision to the sphere after the subdivision. And this here will be an injection. It's kind of, it depends on which point to take which point of view you take, but I mean, if you think about it on the level of cone-wise polynomial functions, it is obvious, right? Because a cone-wise polynomial function uh, before the Artinian, uh, before the subdivision, will be cone-wise polynomial after, right? Somehow you just have more, right? So you, it, uh, you just have more space, but somehow you, you just don't have breakpoints at this, at the points of the subdivision. That's fine. Okay, and then if you think about it, what you can show is that, well, that the subdivision here is really, right, the image under the the image under under this under this map, right? It includes the Kolmogorov polynomials before into those after. So this is just the pullback map plus a component that really comes from the subdivision. So this is really the image of the Giesen. Um, so let me just call it G, uh, not G, G. Um, and this here is orthogonal under, this decomposition is orthogonal under the Poincare pairing. All right. And now let's think about it. Um, let's look at, look at um, I sigma delta um, and its subdivision. So I sigma prime delta and um, I sigma delta. So I sigma delta really consists of all the monomials that, so this here, all monomials 
not in delta. What does this mean? Well, these are all the monomials outside of delta. And now if I, okay, so this here are all the monomials in sigma prime outside of delta. So really, I have the same decomposition here. So why does this, why does this mean? Okay, so again, so I have this decomposition, this is orthogonal. Um, why does this mean that the bias pairing property, so the non-degeneracy of the pairing is true um, before, um, uh, before, if and only if it is true after? Well, it's kind of clear, right? Somehow this, the, the splitting here is orthogonal, so I really only have to, so here I have it, if I, okay, so if I, if I have it before, then I have it um, here, this pairing, this, this here is the, the, the image of the Giesen on which I have Poincaré duality anyway, right, because I have it, right, so otherwise I would already fail here, so I have Poincaré duality here, in particular I have it here. Um, other, the other direction, right, if it fails here, it must fail on one, to, one of these components, and that's it. There's nothing fancy about it. So, by, so this, the, this, this subdivision it really preserves um, the pairing. Um, now, um, let me note that really there was my, um, so now I did stellar subdivisions. I could have been, I could have been more fancy. I could have said this triangle um, is really subdivided into like, um, into something more fancy like attaching a torus. So this looks like a, a attach like a little minion now to this, but I mean, so, um, so really, I could have I could have been more more fancy and more general, but let's somehow so um, for 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 the purposes of PL spheres, I really don't have to go into any fancy kind of subdivisions. But somehow this is really somehow this is a more general principle. Whatever, whenever you can find this map on the on on, on the poly, poly, combois polynomials, right? Whenever you have a nice simplicial map, then you can define the map on combois polynomials. And then you have to make uh, sure that this map preserves the fundamental class, so the Poincaré pairing is preserved. And then you get this decomposition. All good and nice. Um, so now, um, the next step is something that is kind of very nice and old in PL topology is this folklore fact that if I have um, delta, a k minus one dimensional complex, and delta lives inside sigma, a 2k minus one sphere, then delta embeds into the boundary of its regular neighborhood. And regular neighborhood. Of, of delta, all right? So example, if I have a graph in the three sphere, and then I take the neighborhood of the graph, then I can just by, just by basic general position, I can move this graph into the boundary of the regular neighborhood. In particular, in particular, Um, there exists a refinement uh, refinement sigma tilde of sigma such that mm, well okay so I should say refinement sigma tilde of sigma not affecting not affecting delta such that um, delta lies in partial of the boundary. Uh, somehow, delta is a subcomplex of the boundary of the regular neighborhood, which is again a subcomplex of sigma tilde. All right. Um, okay. So, how does this help me? Oh. 
on, maybe I should look this up because that's better. Um, so now, okay, so now I have delta uh, subcomplex of some closed hypersurface, right? Delta boundary n. So this is what we have arrived at now. Um, now we are in, I mean, careful now we are in, in, in sigma tilde, but as, you, as, as we observed there, the Poincare, um, but that we can look at I sigma tilde instead of, I sigma tilde delta instead of I sigma delta, so we are fine. Can you explain how you use delta inside the boundary after you learn a little um, yes. Um, that is because, okay, so what you can do is um, take the regular neighborhood, right? Um, let, me, let me try to, I mean, I cannot draw an example. I'm, I'm a very two dimensional drawer, so I cannot really draw it well um, in dimension three, but so here's the. the um, um, the gist of it, right? So the, here's your regular neighborhood, right? And now push your delta into general position, right? Push it into general position. So in dimension, th in, in, if you do this in dimension three and not two, what you will have will not intersect the original delta. So now you push it into general position, maybe like this, right? Um, so the issue is here now, of course. And then you take the closest yeah. point on the boundary. Yes, yes, you do just do a radial projection to the boundary. That's the same thing. Yes. All right, all right, all right. Where was I? Ah, oh, yes. Okay, so we have um, delta in the boundary of n. Okay, so. Um, so we have, let me draw delta and, and a hypersurface. So so we have delta and then it lives inside this hypersurface here, right? Um, the issue is of course, so what did I want? Well, I wanted that a e of um, a of e, so the, 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 the quotient of the, the, the face ring, um, the quotient of the face ring of sigma corresponding to, to e was actually isomorphic to A of delta. At least I need this in degree k. All right, and again, I should write, write only in white. Um, but in general, um, at this stage, I only have a surjection, right? I have a larger complex. So I can only say that I have a surjection from this uh, larger manifold to delta. So what do I do? Well, um, if, if this is larger, then there is some monomial outside of, um, then there is a, some other, there, then there is an element um, of, um, um, there is, then there is an element of, um, of, of, a boundary n in degree k that lies in the kernel of this restriction map. Um, in particular, there is a monomial, right? So this, this is generated by some monomials, and there is a monomial um, in this, um, there's a monomial supported outside of delta that generates this element in the kernel, right? So there is an, a monomial somewhere, perhaps here, that generates an element in the kernel. So what do I do? Well, what I can do is I can, I can just remove this face and its neighborhood. All right, I remove it and I leave a little hole here. Okay? And I can do this and repeat this several times until I have a surface with holes such that this is an isomorphism. So, Kill elements in the kernel, in kernel, by introducing holes. Holes. Okay? 
Now, um, so far so good. Now the issue is, okay, so it's not so hard to see that um, we can make this, this, this surface sufficiently connected, right? If there were two different components, all right, so well, if, if boundary n had two different components, then what, just because maybe um, our graph had two different components, right, or delta had two different components, then what we can do is we can just attach a handle inside, inside sigma um, and make them connected. So the connectivity is not an option, it's not an issue, and we, us drilling holes does not affect the connectivity, but of course now we have a surface with boundary. All right, so um, um, e, um, e is now not closed. Problem, E is not closed. And so now what we have, to, so we, we have an E that is sufficiently connected that um, in degree k precisely can encodes delta, but it's not closed. But now it's really simple. There's a simple trick that we can use to actually um, produce a closed hypersurface um, that, um, that does the trick for us, that somehow that encodes, that encodes the bias pairing property nicely. Um, so let me, um, let, me, let me use this backboard to finish at least that part. All right, so we have E, K minus one is cyclic. Oh. But um, it has bound, it's small. AK of E is isomorphic to AK of delta, but E has boundary. Um, and now, basically, what we are doing is just we double e. So we look at we look at e solution. So solution. Um, well, take take e, double it. Compactify um, and consider the resulting ideal. So let me explain what I mean. So Okay, I will explain what I mean, what I mean by compactify. Um, so, let's, let's look at E on its, uh, on its own, all right? So E is my surface of boundary, all right? And then, okay, so as Pierre already um, says, okay, I can just double and obtain, right? I, I take E, another copy, and I identify them at the boundary, the canonical way. All right, so um, I have another sheet um, on the bottom, like this. So you, there's no compactification here, you're right. But E lives somewhere, right? Right, so, um, ah. I should I should have said though, this construction of that we did is obviously it's it's obviously orientable the way that we did it. So orientable. Um, so now okay, but so I've how do I how do I how do I deal with sigma outside of right? So this is here outside I have sigma tilde. Um, all right, so really there are some faces here intersecting, so faces of sigma outside 
of outside of outside of outside of e, and now I have right I have I have an orientation, um, and I have an upper part and a lower part. I have simplices intersecting my e from the uh, from the top and simplices intersecting my my e from the bottom, right? And when I okay, so now I want to see this in um, a new somehow I want to look at a compactification of sigma tilde without my surface E as a man, right? So I want to compactify this such that the boundary compactify such that the boundary um, of the compactification um, is exactly the double of E. All right? And really what I do is I really just encode what, what faces do I intersect from the top what from the bottom, and that's it, right? I get a new simplicial complex. So I get all right, something like this. All right, so this is my sigma sigma hat. Um, and now I'm in, now I'm done. Now now I have a closed hypersurface in a um, in a new sphere, so sigma in a in a sphere sigma hat, um, and what remains, and this is somehow, okay, this is a diagram chasing. I will skip, is to show that I sigma tilde e satisfies the bias pairing property if and only if um, I k sigma hat double of e does all right and now i can go back to this theorem that i did for closed hypersurfaces um, and apply it here and i'm done that's it um, all right um, okay so let me summarize um, there is one more caveat that i have to to go over and then um, um, after the summary um, if I identify these two copies I get back my homology yeah but I mean so I, yeah so to fill it in here fill this fill the resulting hand the body in this will be a homology sphere again yeah um, All right. So for the summary, um, so what do we have? So we have the Konecker lemma. And what did the Kronecker lemma give us specifically, right? It told us um, we can construct Lefschetz elements provided. We can prove um, the non degeneracy of pairing of pairing um, not 
or let me say some other maybe maybe yeah, in sigma provided we can show the non-degeneracy of pairing. When what what pairing would we look at? Well, we looked at. I mean, not, not the pairing, what, what spaces, what ideal state we look at. Well, we looked at the kernels of these generic linear combinations of xv, right? But this is not somehow, it's not so important for the moment, um, what, what kernels we looked at. And we, we did, we, lo we looked at the kernel of the, somehow, the already constructed map, right? The, the our, our kind of, our, our candidate for the left shed map that came close, um, in link in A of link of the vertex W in sigma. All right. Remember, somehow there was this. Okay, so we wanted to apply this uh, this, this 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 basic representation theory of the Kronecker equiver. All right. So we noticed that we have to show that the kernel um, of the old map. Mapped under, map, mapped under this model, the perturbation, the, lab, the map that we want to add, right, the divisor that we want to add, um, um, and we want to say that this does not intersect the image, right, um, and then we observe that this is equivalent to just saying, okay, the, the, the pairing on, the, on, on either one of them does not degenerate, and then we were done. But so this we have to show, right, so this, uh, this here, right, so this is, notice that this is in co-dimension one, so we really gained something here in terms of induction. And now, then the second ingredient was by a sparing property, right, so somehow non-degeneracy of um, the pairing at ideals at, okay, so at I sigma delta um, um, well is implied is implied by Lefschetz properties um, at hypersurfaces for hypersurfaces. All right, so this was exactly we identified, we looked at A of E, all right, so why was this a Lefschetz property? Mm. So what we looked what we looked at here, right, was we looked at a of e, um, and this was okay. So this was a co-dimension one manifold inside sigma. So sigma was of dimension two k minus one. This e is of two, dimension two k minus two. So the cool dimension of 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 of, of sigma of of, a, of of k of sigma is one higher than the cool dimension of k of e. So we took out this additional element, and we wanted the kernel under this element to be prescribed, right? So we wanted to have the kernel and the, the co-kernel under this element, under this multiplication, to be prescribed, which is a left shed's property, right? So this here, somehow, this was um, k of e, right? We took out somehow um, somehow a linear system of parameters theta. Um, Theta for for coming from from a, coming from coming from sigma, but this was really somehow it was one too long. So we think of this as really of k of e modding out a linear system of parameters that was one shorter. This here is the Artinian reduction, and then we said something about how this last element l. It's nice that last and left shades have the same letter. Um, that um, this last element, and then we said something about how would this last element act, right? And this last element acting, this is really something saying about this middle isomorphism, which is saying something about the left shots, right? So this is a left shots property. All 
right? Um, so, okay, so the non-degeneracy of the pairing at ideals of this is implied by the Lefschetz properties for hypersurfaces. Um, and so we see that we actually, we, we gain in dimension in both steps, all right? Seemingly, somehow, we, we are in a, uh, um, in, a, in a very nice position. The only issue here, and, um, this is why somehow I said there's a caveat, and we have to, I want to explain a little how to get around that caveat, is that these ideals here, and these ideals, okay, so let me just say it like this. So these ideals here, are not in general of this form, right? So these are not in general monomial ideals. Um, so let me explain briefly how to get around that, how to get around that issue. Um, and then after the break, then we will do a break and then we will go to the transcendental theory proof. So issue, these ideals here are not monomial in general not monomial in general um, or orthogonal complement to monomial right so the issue is not so if i just looked at this here this would be the orthogonal complement to a monomial ideal i would be fine but i'm pulling it back to the link of a vertex which right so i'm intersecting then two ideals and that is not so easy to 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 to, to say that this is a game monomial so um, I have to say something. So intersection of monomial ideals in general is not monomial. Um, so how do I deal with this? Um, so let me let me make some space somewhere. Um, let me make some space here. Right, so it, maybe it's not so clear that this is actually, I mean, that this pact here is a not a, this is not in general monomial idea, so that's a comma. The, um, it's in general just somehow the, the orthogonal complement of the monomial idea, but I could have just as well looked at the orthogonal complement, which would be the image of this generic linear combination, and this would be clearly a monomial ideal, because the image, if I already satisfy the transversal prime property, is just the span of the, the span of the images of the individual maps. But this here is a, right, so this is just generated by the monomials of the individual um, v, in w, v in the index at w. Okay. Um, so how do I remedy this? Well, somehow, let me say that this here is the orthogonal complement. So let me is orthogonal complement to a monomial ideal if um, if the union of the vertices star v in sigma where I go over V in my index at W, and right, I take the union of the vertices again, star V sigma, with the star of the new vertex star W and sigma, if these two objects here are submanifolds, um, submanifolds. Okay, if this is the case, then these are nice ideas that I can deal with in a nice algebraic way. Um, so, how do I then? Well, let me let me give you a situation where this doesn't happen, and then let me describe how I get around it. Yeah, it's it's really just the neighborhood. I take the union of the union of the stars, right? So I take all the small. I all, I take all the faces that 
um, intersect my vertex set, and then I take the simplicial closure. Right? The issue is that somehow this, right? I, I could have some picture that looks like this. Um, and then maybe another vertex here, and this, this could have some nasty singularities here. So it could, this here could be, let me do it. Let me draw it nicer. So this here could be another one, another vertex, and my index set, and it could look like this. And the intersection here is somewhat degenerate. It's not a manifold, so I'm, I'm not in a good business. Okay, so not a uh, good position. It's somewhat not a manifold. Um, so, um, how do I get around that? So let me um, let me let me sketch off um, of of how is this circumvented? Of so, yeah, sketch of proof. Um, so conventing the caveat. Caveat. So here's uh, the trick. So let's say we want to prove, um, um, we want left sheds for, let's say, for, for, for explicitness, let me say, for sigma, a 2k sphere, 2k dimensional sphere. Um, and let's say it doesn't have a nice, it doesn't have an order on the vertices that satisfies this property. So it, you can show that there are, that may, most spheres that you will be looking at in daily life, they will not have uh, an exhaustion by vertex of the vertices in some order such that at every intermediate step you have a manifold. So let's say this is one of these nasty spheres where you don't have an order that is nice. Um, so let's say we just fix an arbitrary order. So arbitrary order, order on vertices. And now the trick is the following. So um, we look at sigma, and this is a sub, uh, it, it's a submanifold, it's a co dimension one sphere in a sphere of. Yeah. Yes, 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 exactly. So, um, yeah, yeah, it, it's a weaker property than shallability here. Um, but still, you can find many examples where you don't, cannot get it. Yeah, that's, that's right. So, this is a weak form of shallability. Weaker than shallability, but still much too strong. Okay? Uh, but so what we what we do now so sigma we can think of as a um, as a co-dimensional one sphere um, in a bigger sphere two k in, in a bigger sphere two sigma bar so this is then a two k plus one sphere um, and then we saw that um, um, observe left sheds. For sigma, all right, this is what we discussed uh, on Monday. This is equivalent um, to saying that um, the ideal I sigma bar sigma satisfies the bias Perry property. All right. And now this is equivalent. Well, now I can again reduce to the k skeleton, right? So this is in um, degree um, k plus one. No. So this is equivalent to saying that I sigma bar, and I take the k skeleton of of sigma satisfies the BPP. The bias pairing property. All right. So, 
So now, let me call this an M decomposition because everything intermediate is a manifold. Maybe M is not so nice, but uh, yeah, and, and, and M decomposition. Okay, so there's an order on the vertices such that every intermediate, um, every intermediate step you are a manifold. Um, so um, now what I do is um, I find a refinement, refinement. Um, Sigma, sigma hat of sigma bar such that um, there exists E, a hypersurface with boundary such that, um, well, what do I want? So, such that. Oh, well, um, AK plus 1 of E is isomorphic to AK plus 1 of, um, of this K skeleton of sigma, right? In particular, right, say the hidden motive here is that the ideals are the same. Sigma hat E is isomorphic to I sigma hat E, uh, sigma, all right, that's the motivation, the hidden one, in degree k plus one. So, um, I find this, and such that E is, has an M decomposition. So it turns out that um, in this co-dimension, you can actually um, construct E in such a way, right? So you can construct many hypersurfaces uh, with the first property. And it turns out that basically by, t by, by, by doing some surgery and twisting this hypersurface a little, you can ensure that this decomposition is actually a nice M decomposition that you get. So now, okay, so now, so now you, you what, what do we have? Well then, uh, but, then the bias pairing property, then the bias pairing property for I sigma hat E uh, in degree k plus one is equivalent to a left shift property for E, all right? This is what we observed. Um, but now this E is nicely decomposable and we can actually apply the uh, induction. So now the E is nicely decomposable, we, but to construct the left shed elements here, well, we apply the Kronecker lemma, but now the kernels here, they are nice. In E, they are nice, um, right? They are nice and orthogonal complements to monomials. So let me... I have this somewhat bad habit of, if there is not enough space, then I will just squeeze it, so let me not do that. Um, but in E, um, the kernel of this direct sum of an initial segment, V initial in the order, um, under the stars of vertices in sigma, pulled back to um, A link of W in E is monomial. And so we can complete the induction now because now we have a monomial ideal, right? And we have gained the dimension, right? So now, E is of the same dimension at the starting sigma. So the dimension, dimension of E is the same as the dimension of the sigma that we started with when we wanted to prove the left sheds. Um, but now we actually gain a dimension because we are looking at the link here, 
All right, so, so now we have the dimension. This is the dimension of the link of the vertex in E plus 1. But now we gain a dimension, um, and therefore we can complete the induction. And that is the, model. That is the overview of this argument. Um, all right, and this is somehow where I want to end with this argument. And then after a 10-minute break, I will go to the transcendental uh, theory argument. All right. So for the final section, um, so what we will do is we will actually we will talk about slightly more general objects, um, and we will give a, a new proof um, based on, 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 on some very nice residue formulas. Um, so beyond positivity again. Cycles and um, transcendentality. Not in kind of a new age way, but uh, in the case in the in the sense of transcendental extensions. Um, okay, we have what is what is our object? We consider mu a simplicial cycle, k cycle, uh, which for me is a pair of a simplicial complex mu. So this is a simplicial complex mu in uh, small in these brackets. Simplicial complex. Which I will call the underlying complex or support or underlying complex. Um, oh, maybe uh, let me specify the dimension here for simplicity of dimension d minus 1, of dimension d minus 1. And I have. Uh, mu, um, the underlying complex, and this is also of dimension d minus 1. d minus 1. And then mu is an element um, in the homology in dimension d minus 1 with k coefficients of this underlying set, of this complex. Um, and this is what I call, for me, a simplicial cycle. All right. Um, now, let me consider A of the underlying complex. All right. But this is always, in, my, in a hidden way, there's also always a linear system of parameters here. Um, right, and this is just 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 the face ring again. So this is really just again k of the polynomial ring modulo i of mu. All right, and now what I will think of well um, is well there I I, I already you know, when we discussed this last time. I explained that there is a um, that there is a canonical isomorphism between H D minus one, this underlying complex, and A D of the simplicial complex. So this is a canonical isomorphism here. And what can I say then? Well, now what I can consider is a dual to some mu b. This is a dual to mu in the cohomology. All right. And what I can in particular do is I can think of mu b as a quotient, uh, mu dual as a quotient of a d. Sorry, I didn't get 
This is just a top degree, all right? It's just uh, I'm pairing on the front of. Okay, so. Um, Makes no sense. Mm. You have you have kind of like fundamental chain. Yes. Yeah? But you don't have canonical commod class. Um. Maybe you see you can say that you have canonical chain. Well, I still have a pairing, right? I can I can still just. Uh, oh, or maybe you're right, because yeah. you have not, not only homology class, but a canonical chain, which yes. you can interpret as a quote chain. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, and then what I can do is I can consider B of mu, and this will be the, um, the smallest quotient. of a mu such that um, v of mu in degree d is exactly this class in degree d. All right, I kill everything, yeah? Get again lost. Uh, yeah. You said you wrote doesn't like that's a d of mu. Yeah, maps to we had it's it's cohomology. You can pair with this homology class. You can make to to your field. Yes, but not to M check. Yeah, uh, because so I want to. I would just want. I would just consider this as a one-dimensional, right? As a yeah. no, 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 it makes no sense. Uh, what is me check? Um. The mu, mu is li it's it's you, you orient your top dimension. Okay, okay, so weights and such the bound is equal to zero. What yeah. is mu check? So mu check is the, okay. So now I have a pairing of degree of of, of degree d to uh, to my field, right? Two k to my ground field. Yeah. Get pairing with your algebra. Okay. Yeah. You get a functional from your things to yeah. Yeah. So I okay. So now this pairing will give me a one-dimensional quotient of this top degree. Right of AD. Yeah, or you get one-dimensional quotient of cohomology. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a class in cohomology. Yes, I get a one-dimensional quotient. Yes. It's not. It's not a class. You see that maybe you want to write. We check it's a dual to mu in HD minus one. It's a quotient. Yes, yes, yes. That's what I mean. So it's a quotient of HD minus one. Therefore, I think of it as a quotient of AD. No, because literally can write it like you get element here. Ah, okay. So yeah, okay. Okay. So quotient. Okay. So it's quotient, yeah, okay, thank you. Of H D minus one. Yeah. All right. Right, and what I get here is essentially the um the uh, the, the, the 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 quotient of A of of, of A of, of bracket mu with the fundamental class, right? Well, with with the prescribed fundamental class given by in, induced by mu. All right. So and again, this still depends, right? So b of mu still in a hidden way depends on theta, right? So this is there's still theta inside. So I should write, right? There's still theta encoded inside. All right. And this is a Poincaré duality algebra. It is a Poincaré duality algebra. Duality algebra, the fundamental class in degree D. Okay. So now I can ask again. Okay, so I can ask again. Does um, does B mu have the left shots property? Uh, 
And again, the theorem. Uh, maybe I should not start on the bottom of this to write the theorem. It doesn't have to be in a manifold. It's just a simplicial complex. Yes. And then you have homology class um, in the simplicial complex. It's not there's no there's no manifold here anymore. Okay? And so the theorem is as follows. This is um, um, joined with Tavos Papadakis and Valisiri Kepetrotu. Um, and for this, I will I will not just say a generic element. So I will I will be a little more specific. Um, so mu. Uh, D minus one cycle over K arbitrary um, this is an arbitrary field and now I take a field extension and what what is the field extension I take so well I have um, the ma ma the matrix theta right and its entries and then I have the element L the left shed element L and its entries All right, and I see them all as in the, in the trend, yeah, somehow algebraically independent numbers. So each of the entries is a variable, and I think of my new fields. I I, I give a field extension where each of the coordinates is an independent algebraically independent variable. Okay, so I have all my entries here, and then basically I take the field extension and take the field of rational numbers with respect to all those variables, and this here will be k tilde. Okay, so um, k tilde, um, rational field of rational functions of rational functions over k, and I extend by um, the individual the individual variables theta. And L. All right, and now, right, well, now I, I mean, I, I'm, imme I, I, I'm immediately a, trend, a generic element. Then, um, then B of mu satisfies the left shed's property. All right, so I e, so let me b mu k to b e mu to the d minus k l to the d minus two k is an isomorphism. Um, it satisfies. The whole Lamar relations um, that is, right, so the Hot Riemann bilinear form QKL um, does not degenerate at. Um, monomial ideals um, and then let me give one additional property that is very nice but we only know it in characteristic 2 so if the characteristic of the ground field is 2 then we have something even nicer and even more beautiful this is that, that Q, this, this Hodge, Hodge, the Hodge-Riemann bilinear form Never degenerates. So Q K L of U U um, is not equal to zero for all U in um, B mu K. 
All right, and here I should say k should be less or equal to d half. All right. So that's kind of the the, the strongest form of 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 not degenerating um, anywhere. Right. Somehow this is somehow no ideal. I, I degenerate at no ideal. That's kind of surprising, um, um, but that's what what happens here. All right. Okay, so but yeah, so we now we we are over this this uh, this field extension. Maybe I should say right. So, all right, this is now over this field extension k tilde. Is it okay, so why is it surprising? Go to the classical Hodgman relations. Right, um, they the, you have the signature plus one and minus one, so definitely there will be one point where they where it will just be zero, the pairing with itself, right? Just by intermediate value theorem, and you can show that tomorrow. I mean, if I pass to the, I mean, if I pass to the algebraic closure here, right? If I take k tilde, but take the algebraic closure, then definitely there will be points. Where this is zero, so this is really something that only works in this. Do you, I mean, you don't have this transcendental property that uh, your algebraic is dependent on the coordinates of the hmm? Okay. But here you impose a very strong property that the coordinates of these linear functions are algebraically independent. Yes. But you say that you can achieve this. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can also achieve this. I mean, okay, so let me open question. What happens in other characteristics, right? Other characteristics. Okay, so it might be true. Yes, yes. But the point is, this will never be true if you pass through the algebraic closure, right? So you take the, the, the extension of the complex numbers by, by, these, transcendental, by these transcendental variables, um, um, then, it is, then it might be true. But if you take the algebraic closure of k tilde, it will not be true. That's the point. Okay? Okay. So, um, let me um, give like the, 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 the first few um, yeah, let me let me try to give you the first. Uh, let me try to give you the first few indications of what we will what we will need. Um, I mean, we will end in like ten minutes, so I think I will have to repeat anyway. So maybe let me give you some corollaries, um, and then give you let me then let me give you an idea of what we will do. Um, all right. So corollary. Um, well, what are say what are nice cycles, right? So, um, so if if sigma or if sigma is a sphere, right? Then you take just the fundamental class as a cycle. Then um, b of b of uh, or a of sigma is just b of the fundamental class. Um, similarly, if M is a manifold, right, an orientable closed manifold, then B of the fundamental class is really just, well, it is 
A of m modulo, well, the kernel of the partitioning map, right? Kernel of A of m to the direct sum over the vertices in, in m, A star of the vertex in m. All right? It's just the kernel of the partitioning map. I mean, uh, but somehow, what else is encoded by, by these? Um, um, well, for instance, pseudo-manifolds. If you have a pseudo-manifold, if, if P is a pseudo-manifold, and it's orientable, then, Um, B of mu satisfies Lefschet. So B of fundamental class satisfies Lefschet. Here's Lefschet. Um, so these are nice examples, but these are, one has to be a little bit careful. So this B of mu here, the, you could look at its Betty numbers, right? You could look at the dimension of the, of the K-graded component and try to extract some combinatorial meaning, right? So for instance, for, for manifold sigma or for, ma or for, for, for manifolds or spheres, and you can also, also show that for, the, for, for, for pseudo-manifolds, um, the dimensions of the graded components are in these cases, the dimensions of the graded components here of the bi um, is independent is independent of the linear system of parameters. So they have a combinatorial meaning, even though in this case we don't have a closed formula, no closed formula. So. Um, in the case of cycles, in general, um, one has to be careful in the sense that there is no combinatorial meaning immediately. So it's really somehow um, a rather interesting uh, property to have left sheds for cycles. Um, and perhaps when, if I'm if I'm kind of done with the sketch early tomorrow, then I will sketch. Then I will give some applications of this. Um, but really, there seems to be no algebraic geometry analog. So this is kind of left sheds, but really there seems to be no good algebraic geometry interpretation of this of this left shed. There is no. Of course, it should depend on the coefficients of the cycle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It depends on the coefficients. It's kind of yeah. Kind of function. Yes, yes. Yeah, but it's a kind of it's a it's more it's. Yeah, it's a left shed theorem that is very far from any kind of geometric interpretation. All right. So, what will be what will be the, the, the idea? What will we what will we work with? Well, we will basically look at residues of the degree function um, and work with them. And so, the main trick is um, well. First, let us let's let's define the degree function, right? So, the degree function is just the map, right? It's just a way of identifying B of mu with K, right? B mu on degree D with K. So how do I define this degree function? Well, here's a way to write it down explicitly for facets. So um, define, define this, or kind of, if you want, you just normalize this by defining it on a facet. Um, define this by, okay, so um, I take a facet for F facet of the underlying complex. So this is again a d minus one dimensional face, d minus one dimensional simplex. Um, and then we can evaluate um, the degree of the corresponding monomial xf in the following way. I consider the vertices ordered, and then 
I look at my cycle, right? And I look at the ordered, the oriented coefficient of my simplicial cycle. So remember, mu, this was an element in H d minus 1 of the underlying complex, right? And then I divide this by the determinant of theta restricted to the minor corresponding for, to f. Okay, this is the determinant of this. Remember, theta was this matrix, right? I think of theta as a matrix with some entries, and then face f cuts out a minor. And I decompute this determinant. And I can prove, actually, that there uh, is, well, uh, well, actually, yeah. Let, let's not do this today, but so we will tomorrow prove that tomorrow we will see that this is consistent. Maybe I will give you just the intuition why this is consistent. And then we will look at this function, and in particular, not for function for, for, for faces f, but we will look at faces. Um, we will look at, we will try to evaluate this at monomials of the form x tau squared, where tau is a, um, is a phase of cardinality, cardinality d half, or at most d half, inside, um, inside, yeah, of cardinality d half inside uh, my complex, and then we will see that this actually, this this function really has a has a has very nice has a, have very very nice poles, and then we will. Um, uh, compute some, some, yeah, we will do some basic analysis with this, prove some nice identity, and then um, this um, anisotropy, this total anisotropy, right, the anisotropy everywhere will just fall off, and then we have to modify a little to do this in, um, in general characteristic, and we'll prove just the Hollermann relations there. All right, and I think somehow it doesn't make sense to, to start with the proof now, so let's, let's finish here, and then because I would have to anyway repeat a lot tomorrow. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.